Welcome back to lecture two. Uh, we talked in our very first lecture of the year about how some of the topics we would cover in these lectures would not necessarily relate to the homework at hand, but that are important to know in order to become a better artist or to become a better appreciator of art. And remember, we also need to keep these things in mind for our final project. So please do take notes on all aspects of every lecture. Uh, this week, we're covering two topics. Um, texture. You can see a very textured artwork by Chris Feely on the left here, and the concept of time in motion as depicted on a 2D surface, as you can see in this very realistic charcoal drawing by Robert Longo on the right. The homework this week will relate to the concept of time and motion. We'll cover texture first. So the word, the vocab term uh, tactile texture refers to the type of texture that we can actually touch. And so everything that is a solid or a liquid, um, anything that is tactile has texture. Um, so things that don't have texture are ideas, light, things like that. Um, anything we can feel does have it. So sometimes we might think of something like a glass tablet screen or phone screen or window as not having texture because it's completely smooth but it does have a texture, it has a smooth texture. And we know it by looking at it because we see kind of a consistency across the plane. Whereas something like a, a pine cone, we don't see a consistent um, light across the plane of the piece. Instead, we see lots of contrast between light and dark. So with the pine cone, for example, every time the woody little sections stick out, it, they catch the light. And underneath where there's a recess, it casts a shadow. And so because we see light, dark, light, dark, light, dark in this sort of a pattern, we have a sense of what the pine cone would feel like to touch it um, without actually having to touch it. Um, similarly, here we see a can of um, interior latex paint, smooth enamel. So let's say we have a very smooth paint on a flat wall. Um, we see maybe a highlight in one area where the light's hitting it in a very gradual transition between light and dark where there's no uh, um, jutting, um, contrasting bright and dark lights. And that's how we know without touching the wall that it is a smooth surface. That um, the, the patterns that the light and dark make and the way that the light and dark transition into each other they give us a sense of what a texture would be. So knowing that, artists are able to create visual texture, texture that it doesn't actually exist um, in their artwork. And so here we see a uh, water, I'm sorry, not a, um, a screen print by Roy Lichtenstein, where he uh, creates images with lights and shadows to create the sense of the texture of this paint on the, on the uh, surface, whereas the actual texture of the surface of the, um, the printed picture plane would be very quite different than you know the way that it looks. So first let's talk about tactile texture and then we'll get back into this idea of visual texture and how artists create it in their work. So um, one type of artwork that has a tactile texture is impasto. And so this is a very close up detail of a Van Gogh painting. I mean, he uses impasto painting. Impasto um, is an Italian word that means dough. And so this word means um, very thick, kind of goopy paint, paint that um, is not smoothly applied to the surface, but rather has highlights and shadows that are real and cast onto the picture plane by its thickness. Another um, type of artwork, another medium that has a particular tactile texture is collage. When we see collage where the edges of one piece of paper are attached to the other, there is a bit of an additional thickness there. Um, this is a piece by um, John C. Zeckard. And um, you can imagine that if this was a piece that, if this was here in real life, you'd be able to touch the edges of, I mean, you shouldn't in a museum or at a gallery, but you could touch the edges of where one piece of paper overlaps the other and you would feel that ridge to the edge there. So that's a tactile texture in an artwork. A more extreme version of collage is assemblage. Assemblage is where an artist, instead of taking something that's two-dimensional and applying it to something that's two-dimensional, like in collage, actually takes a three-dimensional object and applies it to a two-dimensional surface. So this is a piece by Whitfield Lavelle. You can see that he drew uh, with graphite pencil the face of the woman here, and he applied the barbed wire uh, with 
um, I'm not exactly sure how he applied it to the to the surface, but I, I, he probably kind of sewed it in from the back. And so this is a kind of a combination of a sculpture and a drawing, and we call this um, assemblage. I actually had the chance to go to Whitfield Lavelle's studio in New York, and he often makes work that takes this idea of something that's 2D and 3D to an even um, more extreme, where he, I saw a series that he was working on there, where he had taken the barn doors off of, um, um, and actually disassembled entire barn pieces, not just the doors, but kind of larger pieces of barns, from southern plantations, and he used those to draw figures that had been slaves at the plantations. He did research and found out like, who some of the people were there and was able to find photographs of some of the people uh, who were slaves in those places. And he drew, which um, kind of combination of drew and painted them onto the surface of the picture plane, which was the actual wood from the plantation barn. And he um, would um, add a sculptural element that has something to do with that person's life from what he was able to find in his research. So for example, if they had um, if they had ended up work, being in the military, like later in their lives, he would include kind of a globe and kind of military paraphernalia. Um, if they had been like a mother, they might have, you know, things that would have, you know, gone along with uh, motherhood at that time period. And so it would be a two-dimensional um, drawing. And by that, there was a sculpture that was made out of um, things that he found um, that were already existing, not something that he sculpted, but something that he found to place next to the, the drawing um, or painting on, on the wood um, to accompany it. And so it, it, being in the studio was really quite amazing because he had won the MacArthur Genius Award and that comes with quite a big cash prize. And so he was able to collect all kinds of things. And so he had shelves and shelves that looked like a warehouse in the back of his um, giant studio where he lived and worked in, in New York. It's just full of antiques. Um, and he told me that actually he got audited by the IRS because they thought that he had an eBay store, but in fact, he, just, he was just a collector, not a, not a reseller. Another example of tactile texture in artwork, uh, in art making and other mediums is frottage. And frottage is, the, is a rubbing. So if you take, um, when you were a child, you probably had um, things that you collected outside, like sticks and leaves, you put a piece of paper down, your teacher might have had you do a rubbing with grass light on the other side to create um, an image from the texture of the thing against which you're pushing the grass light. And so um, this was used and still is in artwork today. Um, above on the right, you can see a veteran at the Vietnam Memorial in DC that was designed by Maya Lin. And people who have been in uh, Vietnam uh, or whose family members have been there go find the names of people that they know who died in the war and kind of create a rubbing in that way. Um, this is also used in, um, this was used quite a bit in the surrealist period in um, quite often in Germany. So on the left here, we see a piece by Max Ernst, who was a prominent surrealist where he did a number of different rubbings on particular parts of the, the picture plane. Um, so that way he could put them together and create this kind of, uh, this odd kind of fish-like creature Trump Loy, Trump Loy, <laughs> it's hard to say. It sounds really great with a French accent, but um, in English, you could just say Trump Loy, like lawyer or loyal or Lloyd. Uh, it's hard to remember how to say this, but think of those words that'll help you. Um, Trump Loy refers to artwork that is um, painted with such extreme detail in its texture that it actually looks real. And so now we're switching away from um, tactile texture to visual texture. So the, and I'll remind you that visual texture is texture that isn't necessarily actually there, but that the artist paints on or draws on or creates in some way in their artwork. Um, the trick us into thinking that the, the texture is actually there. So Trump Loy is the, one of the most extreme versions of this where the textures are so lifelike that we are tricked into thinking that it's a it's a real thing. And so if you look at the painting of the boy coming out of the frame, the frame is actually part of the painting and not an actual frame itself. And so um, his skin and his clothing and the frame itself all have different textures and they all look so real that it, it looks like he might actually be coming out of out of the wall. Um, and the upper left, you can see a mural. The front of the building is is really 
it's a, a shop, <laughs> a, uh, I think it's a, a restaurant, um, but the side um, is completely painted, but it looks like you could just walk right in there. And that woman is uh, painted as well. And in many churches in Europe, like old cathedrals, uh, you see images like the one on the bottom left. This is an assumption. And an assumption is where people sort of get sucked up into heaven in um, biblical stories. And so on many cathedral ceilings, you will see this. Um, if you look up, you see people sort of floating up into, into heaven. Um, when this idea that textures look so real that we think that it, that it could be real, um, when this is made by a computer, we refer to this as the uncanny valley. Um, and so it's very similar to Trump, Trump Loy, except that it's made digitally and it, we are tricked into thinking that the thing is a photograph um, when in fact it is completely generated um, by computers and by the, the computer artists. And so this is a um, computer generated image and not a photograph of the um, Korean actress Song Hee Kyo and it's made by Max Edwin Wayudi. And so I think at first glance, we would all assume that this is a photograph because it is so lifelike and realistic looking. Not all textures created by artists, visual textures, are lifelike, though, like Uncanny Valley or Trompe l'oeil. Uh, rather, some can be um, invented by the artist and call these invented textures. Uh, so, for example, this is a piece by the artist Chris Kaur, and in this we see, uh, if you look at the trees, for example, you see uh, textures created with dots, with stars, um, and with little slash marks, and these aren't actually the way that trees look if we're in a photograph, for example, or if you're looking outside. These are more of a, a motif, but they still look like they have a texture to them that makes them look not smooth, right? And so um, visual texture is another way that artists can create um, a sense of kind of tactile feeling in their artwork. Here's another example of a invented texture. You see here lots of um, uh, square and rectangular um, edges to artwork. It's light in one section and it's dark behind it in a, in a way that creates um, a rectilinear shape. And so um, within those rectilinear shapes, we also see these little dash marks. It looks like the artist made almost all of the brush strokes with these tiny little horizontal flashes of the paintbrush, right? And this is a piece by Brock, not Barack, but Brock, like broccoli. Um, and he was a contemporary of Picasso. And he was also one of the, the first cubists. And so here he's invented his own sort of visual language and it certainly looks like it has texture to it, um, but it's not something that we see in the real world. So it's another example of invented texture. So let's wrap up this uh, discussion of texture before we get into our next discussion of movement. Uh, so just to recap, we talked about tactile texture, um, the texture that we can actually feel with our hands. And, and we talked about different media um, in art making that incorporate that, such as impasto, the thick paint, uh, collage, paint, like flat on flat, assemblage, um, 3D onto 2D, and frittage, the rubbings. And we also talked about visual texture, trompe l'oeil, the, the painting that looks realistic, uncanny valley, computer generated work that looks like a photograph, and um, any kind of variety of invented textures. Now we're going to get into motion. Um, we can tell when we see a still photograph or a still representation, like a painting, uh, of somebody in movement. And we know that they're in movement because of their diagonal uh, body positioning. And so if we look at Usain Bolt above, you can see that not only is he at a diagonal, but he's in the air. He's completely not touching the ground as he's winning this race. Um, below, we see a George Bellows painting of boxers. Now, this is a moment frozen in time, but you can imagine that if um, Usain Bolt or these boxers were to actually freeze in time, like happens in cartoons, they would just completely fall over because you can't remain at a um, diagonal position while being still. You can only continue on the movement in order to not fall over. So even um, those of you who might take yoga, you know that we, in yoga, people get into 
um, diagonal positions, but they have to have that other limb, you know, arm or foot or whatever, um, stabilizing them in order to stay up or without it, you would completely fall over. And so uh, when we see a human figure presented to us in a diagonal, we consider we know that that means movement in artwork. But it's not just within human figures or any kind of um, actual representational thing. It, we also get this feeling of movement with um, non-representational art. And we'll remember that non-representational means abstract, and abstract means non-representational. So whenever it's not an actual thing, it just kind of shapes, colors, textures, um, that's non-representational. And so here, this is a propaganda poster from the Russian Civil War. Um, and at this time, and during that Civil War, the Red Communist um, armies were fighting against the white royalist armies. And so back then, people in that um, country during the war would recognize the red and the white and what they mean, what they mean, just the way, way that we recognize red as Republican and blue as Democrat. Um, we don't really have to think about it. We just know what it means. Um, and that was the same here. And so looking at this, I, even if you, somebody couldn't read the words within it, uh, which I certainly can't, you can tell that the poster is suggesting that the red communist army is infiltrating and starting to um, kind of win against the white uh, royalist forces. And we know this because we see a diagonal kind of diagonally pushing its way in. So it doesn't it look like that triangle is actually stabbing, <laughs> not only because it is in a diagonal position and it is entering the white circle, but also because it is a triangle that's creating a point. Um, so it looks like it's, it's wedging its way in there. Okay, so we can get this sense of movement even with um, just shapes and colors and textures. The next uh, vocab word I want you to remember is this idea of repeated figure. And I'm just going to pause for a second because I'm sure you want to read the Calvin and Hobbes. Go ahead. Okay, so we in um, in the West read from left to right. So often when we see a narrative represented with um, visuals, we expect it to go from left to right, like we see in uh, the Calvin and Hobbes comic strip at the top. And sometimes, and we call this kind of narrative, um, this uh, way that narrative is shown in an artwork. Um, as repeated figure because you see the figure happening multiple times. So the top version is the most traditional one that we'd expect to see based on kind of Sunday morning comic books. Um, but sometimes these are pre presented without the, um, the divisions between the comic phases. So you can see in the center, the Dubonnet ad, this is a, um, a French ad from many decades ago. I'm not exactly sure. I'm thinking maybe the 30s or the 40s. For this line, you see the gentleman um, is becoming more fully <laughs> colored as he drinks um, the wine. He starts off kind of just as a line drawing, and then he, you know, he comes himself. So. <laughs> but um, so it's very similar, left to right, as the Calvin and Hobbes at the top, except that it doesn't have the divisions. But we don't really need it. We know how to read it. And the bottom is a Masaccio um, artwork from the early Renaissance period in Italy, and this is a narrative that doesn't go from left to right. At the time, a lot of people um, were illiterate, and so um, they wouldn't necessarily look at an image from left to right because although we read from left to right, if you've not learned to read, you might not um, just naturally um, put things in that order. And so back then, uh, this um, kind of uh, scheme of left to right wasn't necessarily the case when we would see a repeated figure. And remember, a repeated figure is um, when you see a figure more than once in order to create a narrative in our work. And so here, we actually see the first part of the story right in the middle, where Jesus is telling St. Peter, uh, St. Peter is the guy with the kind of blue sleeve and the yellowy orange um, toga thing wrapped around it. Um, and Jesus is the one with the pink outfit and the blue kind of toga thing wrapped around him. Uh, Jesus is telling St. Peter that he can find the money that he needs to pay the tax collector in the mouth of the fish, 
And so we start in the middle, and then on the left, we see St. Peter in the water, grabbing a fish, pulling the coins out of his mouth, the fish's mouth. And then on the far right, the story ends with St. Peter. There again, he's thrown three times um, with the exact same background, all one scene. Um, and he's paying the tax collector who's in the little uh, cute little kind of brownish orange tunic. <laughs> all right, so the artists that we see here are at the top, uh, Bill Watterson. He's the creator of Calvin and Hobbes. And then A.M. Cassandre is the one who made the ad for Dubonnet in the middle, and Masaccio was the um, Renaissance Italian artist shown at the bottom. Now, multiple images is slightly different than um, repeated figure, because multiple images, although it shows things multiple times, it's not, it's not trying to give a narrative account. It's not a story. Instead, the multiple image within the piece is meant to show the movement. And so on the far left, we see the Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. So we see the same uh, nude figure multiple times, lots and lots of legs, lots of arms, lots of heads. Um, and the, <laughs> in the upper right, that is um, Giacomo Bella with a doggy and the, the person walking the dog. And um, Again, very similar. The, all the repeated elements are meant to show the movement. And on the right, we have um, Shane Postbissel for Snowboarding Magazine. And he's um, executing a, a jump. This is an important piece from art history. It's a, a set of photographs by Edward Moybridge. And a long time ago, before photography came out, there was a debate in art going back to antiquity. Um, and the artists debated whether a horse ever has all four of its feet off the ground at the same time while it's running at full gait. And of course, when something's running at full gait, it really looks like a blur to us. And so before photographs came out, um, nobody really knew. And so if you look at old paintings of horses, they always have at least one foot on the ground. <laughs> but he um, had this ingenious idea where he set up a number of strings across a racetrack. So as soon as the horse um, running at full gait, hit the string, it would um, pull the camera and create a photograph that happened in that very instant. And so he created this series that shows that, yes, um, all four feet are off the ground, sometimes when a horse is running at full gait. So think about this for a second. Is this an example of repeated figure or multiple image? And I'll let you pause me for a second in case you want to look back the last couple of um, slides and see the difference again. Okay, I'm back. So this looks very much like repeated figure because we are seeing it from left to right, right? It looks like it looks like a same kind of setup as you might see in a comic book, but it's actually an example of multiple image because as we described, repeated figure is more about a narrative and multiple image is more about the movement itself. And so this one was very much about the movement itself are the legs off the ground when the horse is running? And yes, they are. So despite the fact that this was decided uh, over 100 years ago, I think about that time, um, I still never, almost never see a horse depicted in art with all four legs off the ground. I grew up near Gettysburg, which is a Civil War uh, battleground town. And so lots of tourists come to learn about the Civil War. And there are lots of uh, generals, statues of generals from both sides of the war on um, horses and if one leg of the horse is up that signifies that that general was wounded in battle and if both of the front legs of the horse is up it uh, signifies that the general died in battle uh, so it's a little bit of a kind of a clue for us in, in uh, going around the battlefield looking at these but i've never seen you know i wonder how it'd be possible to make one with all four legs up. <laughs> maybe something like like a carousel of the top the top coming up i'd love to see a horse to do it that way um so as I mentioned a moment ago, it was hard to tell before photography whether a horse's legs were all up at once because when something is running really fast like that, like see how my hands look like a blur right now? Um, a blur kind of suggests to us motion. Um, so it's suggested that to us for a long, long time because if we're in a train car, for example, and we're looking at the train, or you know, nowadays in you know your own car, uh, assuming you're not driving and you're the passenger, if you if you look out the window and you you look at something and you look at it as it passes and you focus on it, you don't see a blur. But if you don't focus on anything and you just sort of gaze out 
um, you see a, a massive kind of blurry line passing by you. Um, and so when photography came out, if there's a slow shutter speed, um, it creates quite of a blur in the photograph when um, something is moving. And so it has always meant that to us because we've always seen things as a blur when they're fast. But once photography came out, it came to signify that even stronger in our minds because we see it depicted in, in photography as well um, with the slower shutter speed. So here we have two examples of artworks that have um, motion blur depicted in them. On the left, we see this is a, a painting of a ship um, during a, a big uh, lightning thunder crazy storm at sea. And it's a, a painting by J. M. W. Turner. He was an English um, painter about 100 years ago. And on the right, I'm not sure who the, um, the, the illustrator is here, but it certainly looks like a Warner Brothers uh, illustration, um, you know, a still from a, a cartoon. And we see another example of kind of motion blur used to create the sense of movement in artwork by artists. As I mentioned before, um, in the West, we tend to read from left to right and top to bottom, you know, as we read across a page. Um, so because of that, we tend to see things that are moving toward the right. So this is reporting me backwards, but things moving towards the right as faster than things moving towards the left. And so here I found a an image online of a NASCAR type of car, and I just mirrored it. So on the left, you can see it moving towards the left. On the right, you see it moving towards the right. And most people would um, would think that the one on the right is, is moving faster, even though they're the exact same photograph. That's just how it looks to us. OK, so we talked about um, anticipated motion, which is when you see a, a figure kind of at a diagonal, um, or you see an abstract shape at a diagonal, how diagonals refer to um, motion for us. We also talked about repeated figure, that's the narrative repetition, multiple image, which is the repetition that's used in artwork that relates to the actual act of, of moving more so than the narrative. We talked about motion blur, and we talked about direction, you know, as we moments ago, that things are moving right seem to be a bit faster. And in fact, if we had taken that NASCAR and had it um, just go off the picture plane, so that way it's so far to the right of the picture plane that the tip of its nose that it goes off the page, it would look even faster because it looks like it's gone by so fast we didn't even notice it. <laughs> so for your homework this week, um, I need you to please uh, create an image. Um, it, can, it can be collage, drawing, painting, whatever, using only black and white. And I don't want it to be like shapes created by lines. I want it to be kind of all filled in, okay? So fully filled black shapes against the white background or fully filled white shapes against um, a black background, okay? And I, I'm gonna give a, a demo for this so you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, in the demo, I'm gonna do this as um, a pen and ink but a lot of students prefer to do this as collage. You get a piece of black paper, a piece of white paper, and kind of combine them that way. Uh, it would be a way to do it in a really kind of crisp, clean manner as well. If you feel like um, you have trouble you know, keeping your hand from shaking when you're, when you're inking. Um, and what I need you to do is create a um, action verb. So an example would be explode, run, twirl, any verb that has to do with motion. <laughs> and um, create a non-representational image that gets that verb across. And so remember, non-representational means it's not a person, it's not a unicorn, it's not anything that we could recognize, it's just shapes, black and white shapes. And um, so I'll see you in a moment for the demo. So I'm beginning my project by sketching out a bunch of sketches in the sketchbook like we did last week with the typeface. So I said that you should think of a word that is an action verb, the kind of verb that um, comes with a movement. So I thought of the word explode. Okay, and so the first thing that came to my mind was something like this. And if I were to, if I were you, I would take this initial idea, um, try out a few other things, and then take it to a focus group and ask them. And you know, the focus group could be, your partner, your roommate, your parents, anybody, anybody. And instead of coming to them and saying, does this look like explode? In which case they'll say, oh yeah, sure, I can see that. Don't say that, just say, what 
do you think this looks like? What verb is this? And then they might say something like splash, right? Because it sort of looks like liquid, the way that uh, like drops of, you know, like a, somebody just did a, a, a belly flop into the pool and it went splash, <laughs> something like that. So asking other people their opinions, um, what the verb might be can give you a good sense if you're in the right direction or not. And so I thought, after drawing this, that it looked like splash. And so I thought, let's have something that is the kind of center of the explosion. So I added this in, and then I thought, well, that's, that's better than this, but um, let's see what it would be like vertically. And I didn't particularly love that. And so I thought this is the best of my initial three, and so that I tried different things off of that. And so um, in this part, I hadn't started to decide what parts would be black and which parts would be white yet. So I, I'm trying it again down here and I decided that an explosion normally happens in an environment. Something has to explode, you know? And so I thought, let's give it a room to be in or some kind of horizon plane. And so now we have the same as this, but with um, kind of a horizon where the explosion above the horizon is black on white and below it is white on black. And, um, you know, the more I look at this and I would show this to other people if I was you. Uh, I would still think it doesn't quite look like it exploded. It still has too much of that liquid kind of feel to it. And so uh, my next idea was to put in um, some more rectilinear shapes. And we remember that rectilinear shapes are shapes made of entirely of straight lines, right? And so this is just a sketch. And so it's not perfectly straight lines here, um, but that's the idea um, as opposed to these more liquidy shapes. And it already looks a little bit more like explode, but it sort of looks like electrified, doesn't it? And so I thought something, uh, I think the environment that I created wasn't enough to make it look like a building or a city block or a forest or something exploding. Like something has to explode. And so then I gave it more of an environment to be in here. And I think this looks a lot more like explode than anything else I've done so far um, because now we have a bit of a structure. Some things look like they're closer to us. Some things look like they're farther back. And the explosion isn't just coming out to the sides. Now it's sort of coming forward because it's like coming in front of some shapes going behind some shapes, like in here. Um, and so I think that this is a lot closer to an explosion. Um, and so this is a sort of idea that I, I'm gonna bring into my final project. Of course, I, I'm not doing a million different sketches here just because I don't want this video to be terribly long for you guys, but you should certainly spend a lot more time trying out different ideas than I did. And so, this is done with a light H pencil. I'm just sketching it in here. And so I have a good sense of where I want things to be. So I'm deciding to ink it. But if there's an advantage to doing it as a collage, either um, you know with black and white paper cut out over this, if you don't know exactly how you want things to be, so that way you can move things around and before you decide where you ultimately want things and you lay them down. So that can be a real benefit if you're still inconclusive about what you want your shapes to be or where you want them to be. And so this is very lightly sketched out because I'm going to ink it. Um, but looking at this, I made a couple of decisions that um, changed in the, in the final over here. So I noticed that um, some of the shapes like this one don't point directly to the center of the explosion. They sort of point over here. And so in my final, it's hard to see because it hasn't been inked yet, I'm having every single shape point right to the middle here so that it looks like everything is blowing out of this centerpiece. Also here I have a lot of sort of big wide angles, um, you know, not completely obtuse angles, but you know, fairly wide angles. And so in my final, I want it to look more like a really, um, violent explosion. So I'm going to make my my uh, shards that are blowing out of the middle, I'm going to make them more acute angles. So more um, tight and pointy. And they all go point right towards the center of the explosion. Um, okay, so I will come back in a few minutes, which this is further along in the inking, so you can get a sense of what the final piece would look like. But first I want to show you a different verb. So I picked the verb explode. It's a verb that has uh, a lot of movement in it. Um, and the uh, the if you pick a word that has a lot of movement in it, it's gonna be easier um, to come up with something that really looks like that word. Um, whereas if you come up with a word that technically is 
an action verb, but is one that um, doesn't have as much movement in it. Like for instance, last year uh, I said, I was doing some drawings of, you know, possible ways to create abstract um, versions of words and a student yelled out, hide, the word hide. And of course, that is a verb in which you don't move a lot. You're actually trying to stay still so nobody sees you and you're hiding. It wasn't impossible to do, but it's a lot more open to interpretation. So you could think about actually hiding. So I set up an environment with all these verticals on this like, um, it's like a rhythm that's set up in here, thick and thin li vertical lines. And I have this little shape that's sort of trying to squeeze itself behind one of these lines. And so I, that was a possible way to do hide, I thought. We also can think of this idea of hiding in plain sight, you know, when you just, you're not really hiding, but you are trying to fit in <laughs> so people don't notice you. And so here we've got a shape that is a white circle on black when all the other ones are black circles on white. And so this is a little bit more like um, a Where's Waldo kind of thing where you're looking for it. But the problem with this is either of these could be like interpreted really differently. So like a person could look at this and interpret it as fizz or, um, you know, another kind of verb that has to do with, with bubbles, you know, um, um, carbonating, something, something like that, as opposed to hiding, because, I mean, ultimately, if you're hiding, you are trying not to be noticed. And so <laughs> the, you, the word would be successful if they couldn't, people couldn't figure it out, you know? So that's not like, that's not one that I would go with. I wouldn't go with this word hide. I'd go with something that has a lot more action to it just to make it a little bit easier on yourself. Now, if you do want to make it more of a challenge for yourself, then you could come up with a word that's not quite as obviously about movement, um, a verb that's a little bit more um, subtle just to give yourself a challenge. Um, but I'd probably stick to a word more like this. Okay, okay. at this point, this point, I am pretty far along in my project here. I've pretty much inked this on here, but I left a couple of mistakes to point out to you. Um, so for one, pretty obvious one, is that I said that I don't want anything to be completely outlined. I want everything to be either a full white shape or a full black shape. So this one is not quite done yet. We don't want any things that are just made out of lines. We want entire shapes. So in this project, I freehanded the inking of it because I um, have been a professional artist for about 10 years and the work that I make is really fussy and detailed. So I'm pretty good with my hands, <laughs> but um, I don't recommend that you do that because even somebody like me who's been making tiny little marks for a long time makes mistakes. And here you can see how my, what was supposed to be a straight line going across and meeting up here actually ended up bowing down. So I would have to go to the campus store and get some white out and wipe that part out, or maybe um, paste a little sliver of white um, cut out paper over here, a little collage to wipe that back out. But it won't look quite as good as if I had not made the mistake in the first place. Now I use the Sharpie to ink this. Um, and one problem with the Sharpie is that even though you can get a pretty tight point, I wanted this to look like shards. And so I want a very, um, you know, shards of glass kind of like for the explosion, um, even though it's still abstract, it just shapes, but that kind of scene. And so I need to go in with a, another pen or I could use the black um, from the, the tip of this pen hasn't come off yet. Or I could use the black colored pencil, make it really sharp. And I can go back in and fix up my points. So if you feel like you don't have a really um, tight hand, you could always do the um, collage method instead, you know, cutting out black paper or cutting out white paper um, and applying it to the other surface. So um, if you decide to do that, there's no wrong way to do it. You can use your X-Acto knife to cut along an edge to get a straight line with a um, a ruler. You could take, if you wanted to make a circle, you could take a cup and cut around the cup. Um, it's not cheating at all in order to use forms to try to um, get your uh, your shapes exactly the way you want them. Now, um, because I sharpied this, I inked it, I need to go back now because there's some splotchy bits. The longer, the slower and longer that you spend um, with the Sharpie touching the paper, the darker it will get. So I need to go back and just darken up all these little splotchy bits so that it's all really black. Um, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna fix all these little points. 
and um, I filled in all the shapes that there's nothing that's made just out of outlines. And then I would be ready to turn this in. And there is one last thing that I just meant to mention and I forgot. Um, I had talked about how I wanted to make all the, or most of the, um, the things shooting out of the, um, the explosion, a sort of acute angle. And so you can see compared to the original sketch that I did, most of them are more tight, tight acute angles. Um, there are a couple that are more wide just for variety. Like this one's pretty, pretty um, wide. Um, but I um, had said that I also wanted them all to be sh like shooting right out of the middle. So this would be about the middle of this thing. And you can see that some of them really do seem to shoot right out of the middle. Um, but this one just sort of comes right to this tip. And so I didn't stick to my goal in every single spot. And I think this could have been a little bit stronger if they all had kind of faced towards the middle because it would look more like it was all exploding out of that. Um, this, like having it turned a little bit slows, makes it look a little bit like it's slowed down. Um, but anyway, this is pretty good and it gives you a great idea of what you should be doing. Of course, don't use the exact same word explode when you do yours. Think of your own action word and I can't wait to see what you do on when we get together in class. Um, in a couple of days, you're going to practice this as groups. You know, we'll do a, a design challenge and then you will be able to pick your own word um, to do for your homework.